chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is sponsored by EveryPlay. Make a resolution this year. Save money, save time, and save yourself the stress with the value pricing and quality meals from EveryPlay. Try today from the list of delicious and easy to make recipes and not only save on your first order, but also sign up for $1 Steaks for Life. Get a meal for $1.49 plus $1 Steaks for Life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49DART. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 Steaks. Again, that's everyplate.com slash podcast, code 49DARK, for up to a $110 value. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 11. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Dominic Eagle, Brian Martinez, N.M. Brown, and Seth Paul. Tonight, we'll hear stories of medical monsters, terrifying townsfolk, gastronomic ghoulishness, and concerning coincidences. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors... Turn your lights down low. Settle in. <laughs> the show's about to begin. <laughs> Have you ever find your life not quite going to plan? Or notice weird things about your neighborhood? Or your neighbors that just don't seem quite right? Maybe it's just coincidence, or maybe there are things behind the curtain of normal life that we'd be best off not knowing. Because if we know too much, they may not take too kindly to it. Dominic Eagle brings us our first tale of the night, a wonderfully sinister feature of a company that seems to be doing a great job employing people in a small coastal town. Except that the employees themselves are finding the jobs not so great themselves. If only they knew more about their mysterious employer's new project. 
although some may get a lot closer to it than they'd like to know. Without further ado, I present to you Eclipse. What products are we creating, I ask? We don't ask questions here. That'll be your first and last. Just sign the contract, Mr. Bradley. Mr. Farrington said, There are always others who... No, 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 I want the job, I interjected. I had my reservations about certain clauses within the document. The wording was unusual. I seemed to be waiving far too many rights, basic human rights, one might argue, and I almost found myself requesting a lawyer before putting pen to paper. But that was a luxury I couldn't afford. Mr. Johnson was right. There would most certainly be others willing to take the position. It wasn't a matter of wanting the job. It was a matter of needing it. My town had been struggling for decades. Once a prosperous seaside destination, it had become a ruinous, ghostly resort, allowed to fall into disrepair. And this was the case for many British coastal destinations. Locals flocked abroad for their holidays in the summer, and we hardly ever received foreign tourists. Our economy was practically non-existent. So imagine our joy upon discovering that Eclipse, a lucrative organization specializing in experimental technology, planned on opening a headquarters here. For many of us who'd been commuting to nearby towns and cities for work, it was a lifeline we sorely needed. You took the job? Come on, you are a bunch of city fools, Sam. You don't need them, Mr. Johnson huffed. We all need them, Mr. Johnson, I told the grumpy shopkeeper. This town's dying. Dying? Poppycock. It's coming back to life, boy. You'll see. Global warming's gonna put everything straight. Summers are getting warmer in this country. Holidays at home are gonna start looking pretty good again. I stifled my laughter at the shopkeeper, relishing in the prospect of Earth's demise, all for the greater good of the town's tourism industry. Unwilling to be lectured any longer, however, I simply smiled and lightly nodded my head at him. He folded his arms crossly, tapping his foot furiously, as if he were itching for the opportunity to scold me. But I didn't give it to him. Packing up my food, I quickly left the store. In retrospect, Mr. Johnson was right to be suspicious of Eclipse. If only the rest of us had not been so naive. The company building had sprung into being in a matter of weeks. A glass monolith on the cliffside, an unnervingly out-of-place monstrosity. The brief construction time baffled town residents, but that was just one of many mysteries surrounding the secret of business. And though I was one of the few lucky locals with the qualifications necessary to secure a role at the company, I certainly wasn't privy to any of those secrets. I only knew what I needed to know for the purposes of my rule. I was an outsider, but so were the others who gathered alongside me in the cramped office space on our first day at Eclipse. We stood still, gormlessly eyeing the short, withered woman who shuffles towards us. Mrs. Cole, our line manager, a woman we would never see again. Level 11, remember that. Log it into your heads. This is your floor, she said. You'll take the lift directly to 11-11 at all times. Requests to access other floors will always be denied. Understood? My colleagues and I aggressively nodded our heads. Sweat collected on my brow. I think we all sensed that something was very wrong with that place, and I'd certainly read plenty of disparaging articles about the company's murky history. We all had. Stories of disappearing people, deaths, suicides, all things that the CEO had explained away, things that were unrelated to the company. And I was willing to believe the lie. Desperation will push a person beyond their ethical bounds, If the paycheck would keep a roof over my head, I'd gladly play by the rules. That's what I told myself on the first day. Besides, I was only a low-level engineer. My daily routine consisted of keeping systems operational and not asking questions. They didn't hire me to ask questions. They hired me to answer them. Mr. Farrington made that very clear in my initial interview. I could see some of the moving parts involved in the company operation, 
but I could never see the full picture. That was sufficient to keep us in the dark. Even now, seeing what I've seen, I can't tell you the full story of Eclipse. There's so much I still don't understand. What do we do in this situation? Clarissa asked. The meek, skinny, pale girl startled me. She never usually spoke. Her question jolted me away from my screen. In fact, it was rare for any of us to discuss work. When we talked, we talked about things happening outside of those glass walls. Family, friends, joyous things. Things that distracted us from our work. Our ominous bosses. Our company mysterious goals. The darkness that shrouded all we did. There was no room for communication about work. After all, as I've said, we knew the deal when we accepted the contracts we were dealt. It wasn't a role for those who might ask questions. But, sure enough, that was exactly what happened on that day. I found myself in an interesting predicament. For the first time in a month, one of my fellow engineers was asking me for help. And so I followed her to her workstation, heart leaping in my chest. It should have been an indicator of the company's hostile and unyielding atmosphere that a simple question would elicit such a dread in my body. I'd call it a hostile work environment, but there was no environment of which to speak. I'd almost forgotten that there were other people on level 11 with me. What's up, Clarissa? I asked as we arrived at her desk. She pointed a shaky finger at her screen. Level 13. That's what the email says, right? she asked. I leaned over and squinted at the text on the screen. You've been requested on level 13. Urgent. Do not respond. Drew Farrington, director. I stood up, straightened my shirt, and unleashed a deep sigh before scratching my chin thoughtfully. I've not misread that, have I? she asked. I gulped and shook my head. But we're not supposed to request access to any other levels, and we're... we're not supposed to ask questions, Clarissa said. I don't want to lose my job. Do I just... ignore the email? Did you get one like it? I shrugged. Not as far as I remember, but I do shove things straight into the deleted folder. I'll check after lunch. But I'd say this warrants contacting Mrs. Cole. She said that those who ask questions aren't part of the Eclipse family, I finished, sighing. She said emergency are the exceptions. Is this not an emergency? Mr. Farrington called it an urgent matter, but he also said not to respond. Maybe I should go to level 13, she said hoarsely. Requests to access other floors will always be denied, I said, echoing Mrs. Cole. I suppose you could try, though. If they refuse access, you say you did as asked. Do you think that's the safest approach, Clarissa asked? I sighed. This place is the worst. But yes. Is this job or no job, she shrugged. I walked with her over to the lift as if she were an inmate on death row. The other engineers, working quietly at their desks, shifted uncomfortably in their seats, eyeing the colleague who was about to do the unthinkable. And as she pressed the button labeled 13, Clarissa offered me a weak smile. I'm sure it dissipated as soon as the doors closed. She knew, as well as we all did, that this was more than a company with a toxic culture. The eight of us working on that floor sat anxiously for the rest of the workday. None of us looked at our screens. We eyeballed the lift doors anxiously, awaiting Clarissa's return. She left at midday, and she didn't return. As the sun started to set and the clock ticked past 5 p.m., we all rose to our feet. With somber expressions on our faces, we silently glanced at one another. Clarissa had confirmed what we always feared. The stories about Eclipse were true. We bundled into the lift together, safety in numbers, I suppose, and rode down to the ground floor. It was of paramount importance that we leave the building with plenty of time, no working later than 5.30 p.m. That had been an important clause in the contract, and though I'd thought it to be one of the few healthy aspects of the company work culture, initially it had taken on a new meaning. Clarissa had broken one of the rules, and we never saw her again. You might think we were overacting on that initial day, 
After all, Clarissa could have been busy fixing some major engineering issue on the 13th floor. It might have taken her hours. But we knew that wasn't the case. We felt it. We had always felt something to be wrong with that place. And as the days passed without any sign of our colleague, we realized that we weren't paranoid. This was, and always had been, more than a simple case of an unhealthy working environment. Five days, Johnny muttered to me on my lunch break. It's been five days since anyone's seen her, Sam. You know, I lied to her mother the other day. I said Clarissa went on a business trip for the month. I didn't want her to go sniffing around asking questions. Who knows what they'd do to her. But that'll only help for so long. She's still worrying about her daughter not picking up the phone. What do we do? This never should have happened. We never should have signed those contracts. We always knew, I whispered. We knew this place was off. Why did we stay? And why did I tell her to? I did this to her, Johnny. I told her to go up there. It's not your fault. How were you to know, he asked. I can't get away with this. I'm going to ask them what they did to her, Rachel said. Screw it. I'm ringing Mrs. Cole right now and... Are you an idiot, I blurred. I... Sorry, that was... I didn't mean that. Look, we can't lose our heads. We don't ask them things, Rachel. Clarissa has shown us what's happened when we break the rules. But we don't know what's happened to her, do we? Rachel pressed. Let's not build them up into mythical beings. They're people. Cruel people, but people. I don't know, I said. I've read things that people say about them online deaths for which they were supposedly responsible, but they always dispelled the rumors. Well, they won't get away with it this time, Rachel said. I think we need to call the police. What? Peter and Michael? That's our entire department, Johnny snorted. Those two belong in a retirement home, not stepping toe-to-toe with these monsters. Face it, Rachel. Eclipse chose this town because they knew we wouldn't be able to put up a fight. A ding from Rachel's computer interrupted our conversation. She sighed, returning to her computer. And then, oh no. What? Johnny asked. I, uh, this can't be happening. She whispered. The two of us strolled over to her desk and the other engineers on the floor joined us. We stood silently, reading the horrifying email that had appeared on her screen. You've been requested on level 13. Urgent. Do not respond. Drew Farrington, director. I'm going home, she said. I'm going. I... Rachel, we talked about this, Johnny warned. Who knows what they might do if we try to leave? Well, I'm not going to level 13, she cried. I know, I know, he said. I'll go, I whispered. The other seven engineers twisted their heads to stare at me blankly. The words had escaped my mouth before I even considered them. But I know why I said it. Guilt. Sheer, all-consuming guilt. It was my fault that Clarissa had gone missing, and I couldn't let that happen again. For the past week, the horror of Clarissa's disappearance had taken a heavy toll on my mental well-being. I might have believed I deserved whatever punishment the Eclipse Gods would deem fit for me, but mostly I was simply relieved to see the thankful look on Rachel's face. Her eyes swam with tears of gratitude as I stepped into the lift. They didn't ask for you, Johnny said. I know, I replied. So what do you think will happen when you show up, he asked. If anything, I hope it buys you some time to get far away from here, I said. Take your families and go. I pressed the button, labeled 13, and a wave of nausea overcame me as a red ring encircled the foreboding number. What was I doing? Too late to question that now. As the lift doors closed, I embraced my certain doom, and with a slight rumble, the lift began to climb higher than I'd ever seen it go before. The numbers on the screen scrolled excruciatingly slowly. From 11 to 12, from 12 to clunk. No resounding ding, no cheery marker to announce my arrival, just a resounding thud. The sound of machinery grinding to an unwilling halt. Even the building didn't want me to enter that floor. I found myself praying, in fact, that the doors wouldn't open. But they did. 
And there was no armed security guards, no vicious drooling hounds with fangs poised to tear into my flesh. There was only a long corridor paved with spotless, reflective tiles. It led towards a sleek wooden desk manned by a rather bored receptionist. Perhaps I've built this up in my head, I thought. Perhaps. Samuel Bradley, the woman called. Were you emailed? No, but I... The woman abruptly scraped a chair backwards, creating an almighty squeaking sound, worse than chalk against a board. And without responding, she vanished down a corridor. I was left alone on that eerie, unremarkable floor. Level 13. The title that had carried such weight seemed so ominous, and yet it was an empty, lifeless husk. This is just a company, I reminded myself as I walked along the hallway, and like Rachel said, these are just people. As I reached the desk, I turned my head to the left, facing a pair of double doors through which the receptionist had presumably vanished. I walked towards them and tried one of the handles. They were locked. But I could see something through the small ovular windows, something that I hadn't expected from a company supposedly specializing in technology. What appeared to be a medical laboratory. Dozens of white-coated men and women were hurriedly running about, busying themselves with equipment. And there, standing in the middle, were two people. One was the receptionist, and the other was Mr. Farrington. My body clenched as she pointed an accusatory finger in my direction, and that was when the director's eyes locked with mine. I wanted to run, but I made a promise to Rachel. I was doing this for her, and I was doing what I hadn't done for Clarissa. And that was what I kept repeating in my head as the man approached appearing far taller and more menacing than he had in the interview. He swiped the card, unlocking the double doors, and offered me a wry grin. "'Where's Rachel Johnson, Samuel?' Mr. Farrington asked. "'Where's Clarissa?' I answered. I expected the smile to drop from his face. I expected the ground to cave beneath me as I'd done the unfathomable. I'd asked a question." but Mr. Farrington's smile only widened into something too horrific for any mortal man. And that was when I decided Rachel was wrong. These were not people. Human, perhaps, but only physically. Follow me, the man ordered. I didn't have to do so. I didn't have to do anything. But I think the director sensed that I was compelled to follow. Compelled to right my wrong, and so I walked with him, past puzzled technicians working on some inexplicable thing. You asked a question during your interview, he said. Are you yearning for an answer? I only want to find Clarissa, I answered. Mr. Farrington laughed. We're nearing the answer to all your questions, Samuel. Eclipse is more than a company. It's the next step in human evolution, but even that... No, that's contrived. We're doing something that nature itself cannot do. We're striving for perfection, Samuel. Perfection of humanity. The man stopped before a large glass cylinder, at least ten feet tall. It was clouded with a thick, filthy water. But I knew something was inside. I could see shadows dancing against the inner pane. He nodded at a nearby technician who fiddled with something on a screen. That is the face of true beauty, Mr. Farrington announced, nodding at the cylinder. As the muck of the water began to clear, a shadowy shape suddenly burst to the forefront of the cylinder. It was a person, and I screamed as I realized I recognized her. Clarice, I started, but something was terribly wrong with her. The true horror was her face, the face of true beauty, as Mr. Farrington put it. Eyes large and unfeeling, skin impossibly smooth, as if it were made of latex, lips voluminous and mouth too wide for her head. She was no longer pale, nor skinny, nor short, but she was the farthest opposing extreme in every way. She no longer looked human, and judging by the terrifying emptiness in her eyes, she wasn't human. What of you? What? I began. We don't kill people, and we don't make them go missing, Mr. Farrington said, despite what you and your friends may think. My body shivered as I realized that, of course, our conversations, our scheming, 
had not gone unnoticed by this deranged corporation. They knew everything. I hope my friends escaped. We're just trying to help you achieve perfection, he continued, smiling unevenly. Isn't that what you want? It's what all people want. She's a monster, I cried. Clarissa howled and thumped the inside of her glass prison, powerfully enough to shake the cylinder and its foundations. Muffled by the water, her scream still carried such volume, such pain. I don't know whether her eyes were those of the co-worker I'd briefly known. I don't think they were. But something saw me, something horrific, but still capable of feeling in some deep, inconceivable way. She rejects your notion. Mr. Farrington said. She knows she's the truest form of humanity. As I locked eyes with the creature, with blue eyes, which I realized were unblinking, I sensed its rage building. It was hauntingly unable to express emotion in its altered face, but I could feel its pain. I could sense whether its fury might be directed toward Mr. Farrington, me, or simply everybody and everything for creating it but I noticed a slight crack in the spot that she had thumped, and that was when I decided to do something utterly reckless. Does she hear us, I asked. Mr. Farrington nodded. Yes, you do, don't you, girl? So she obeys you, I continued. Of course. She knows that she was nothing before this. I created her. The man played right into my question, and Clarissa with her round and expressive grotesque features, exploded into a round of glass thumping. Mr. Farrington, oblivious to my method, continued to approach her cage, laughing at the poor woman as she trashed a boat in the water. His laughs only started to wane as he noticed the growing crack that I'd first noticed moments earlier. The tranquilizer, Enfield, now, he screamed. It was too late. The cylinder shattered, not with the slow splintering of a crack in the glass, but with an almighty roar of cascading glass and water. I turned to run, but the water swept me off my feet, as it did the other technicians in the room. I was swept along the floor, cutting my arms and legs on shards of glass. An alarm sounded, and employees either fled or rushed to the scene. But when I looked up, it was not Clarissa for whom I should have been concerned. The woman, who stood a little over six feet tall, and yet she somehow towered over those around her, perhaps due to the fact that they were cowering in fear. I watched in horror as she seized Mr. Farrington by the lapels of his coat, hoisting him up so that his eyes met her, her gargantuan, unmoving eyes. Please, Clarissa, I... Are you in there? Can you hear me? The part of you that's still human must... His pleas were cut short. With immense, unimaginable strength, Clarissa snapped the man as if he were a twig. His life drained in a moment as every single bone in his body splintered. She did it with ease, much as she had broken her own cage. I trembled in the puddle collecting around me as the inhuman abomination proceeded to tear through eclipse workers like brittle branches on a forest floor. Soon the scream subsided and the only remaining noise was the blare of the alarm. And the only remaining things in that room were her and me. She surveyed me for several endless seconds. Those eyes still haunt my dreams. That plastic skin. I braced for death, but it never came. I don't think she remembered me. I don't think she was even Clarissa anymore. But she understood that I'd freed her. She understood that I'd also been imprisoned, and there was only one thing left for her to kill. I reached out a hand pleadingly as I watched her barrel toward one of the windows, overlooking the cliff edge, but I couldn't stop her. She moved at an unimaginable speed, and she fell through the window. I rose to my feet and fled. I made it out. Haven't heard from my colleagues since that day. As for Clarissa, I hope she survived the fall and slaughtered the bosses of Eclipse one by one. She is a horror beyond horrors. But that company is the only thing I truly fear.
I hope you enjoyed Eclipse by Dominic Eagle as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, well, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Dominic dash Eagle. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash D-O-M-I-N-I-C dash E-A-G-L-E. This episode is sponsored by EveryPlay. It's a new year, and one thing we all know is that many make resolutions, but few will stick. Well, how about trying something that'll save you your valuable time and money and still result in delicious meals for everyone in your household? Every plate from the people behind HelloFresh provides you delicious meals sent right to your door for cheaper than your typical fast, casual restaurant. Just select from a list of 25 meal options that rotate on a weekly basis, all containing quality ingredients and with quick and easy options, you can have a meal from stove to plate in less than 30 minutes and with easy cleanup to boot. With the money you'll be saving, you can put it toward other savings for 2024. And that's not all. With your weekly order, active subscriptions can add a 10 ounce ranch steak for just $1. So if you love cooking like I do, but looking to save time in the kitchen, that's what's so great about every plate. I can't imagine a better time to get yourself a resolution that's not only easy to keep, but gives you great value without losing quality. Try every plate today. Get a meal for $1.49 plus $1 steaks for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49DART. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 steaks. Again, that's everyplate.com slash podcast code 49DART for up to a $110 value. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Oh, the search for perfection. I've noticed that those who seek absolute perfection are, well, they're either very, very imperfect themselves or are violently murdered by their creation. Either way, I recommend just doing the best you can. Sometimes it's who moves into your town. Sometimes it might be just the town itself that hides its dirty little secrets. For one fellow, as brought to us by Brian Martinez, he and his friend are about to find out that there are some people that don't want you to know more than you should. Without further ado, I present to you the silent. Something's wrong with this town, and I'm tired of pretending there isn't. Folks who grew up here have heard stories our whole lives. The kids who died out by Lake Conklin in the 80s at the hands of the so-called bludgeoner. Eddie Thomas, the old man who ran the Sunset Farm's bed and breakfast, who also went insane and carried out those despicable murders. Countless people disappearing on jogging paths or out in the woods, phantom roads, unexplained drownings, you name it. We have a story about it. I've always dismissed them as nothing more than campfire stories, tales made up to scare kids and give adults a good laugh at parties. But now, now I'm starting to think there might be some truth to, or at least, a few of those stories. Because if one of them, just one of them, turns out to be true, what does it say about the rest? I was in college, good old San Palmo University, the first time I saw the symbol. Paul Evers told me about it, or rather did everything in his power not to tell me. Paul had a habit of making things up, like when he said a flower lady abducted his friend from elementary school. So I didn't believe him at first. We were in chemistry class, and Mr. Mobry was droning on about the periodic table of elements. You know, silicon, lithium, nitrogen, cerium, so on. I was at the back of the class, and Paul was in the seat next to me, being quieter than usual. When I looked over to see what he was so preoccupied with, 
I noticed he was drawing a symbol in the margins of his notes. It looked like an S laid on its side with a spike driven through the center, plus a few other embellishments around the outside. Quite honestly, it looked too elegant for something Paul would have come up with on his own. What was weirder, it looked familiar to me, as if I'd seen it before in a movie or maybe somewhere around town. When Mr. Marbury turned his balding head, I leaned over and asked Paul what it was. To my surprise, he jumped as if I caught him doing something he shouldn't. He shifted his hand and tried to cover up his drawing. I told him it was too late, I'd already seen it, and he tried to play it off like it was just some doodle. Before he could explain himself any further, Mr. Marbury's voice interrupted us. Anything you'd like to share with the class, he asked, hands on his pudgy hips. Uh, no, Paul said. No, sir. Good. Then keep your lips shut until the end. Paul and I just nodded, and Mr. Mabry got back to teaching. We did as he said and kept our mouths shut for the rest of the class, but that didn't mean I forgot about the symbol Paul had drawn in his notebook. I'd seen a look of relief when Marbury caught us. He was actually happy for the interruption. Now it was the principle of the thing. I needed to know what it was. Paul was cutting through the parking lot when I surprised him by walking in front of him. By the look on his face, he'd been trying to avoid me. He actually cursed under his breath when he saw me. Paul usually couldn't shut up, especially about something he knew that others didn't, so it was strange to see him avoiding a topic. You could tell me about that symbol or what, I asked, blocking his way to his car. Shut up. He looked over his shoulder back toward the science building. He was being dramatic, or so I thought, and I laughed at how ridiculous it all was. It's not funny, he said. I crossed my arms, waiting for him to talk. Not here. Are you crazy? He grabbed me by the arm and pushed me toward his car, looking back every few feet like we were being followed. When he reached his car, and he was sure we were alone, he lowered his voice and looked me dead in the eye. What do you want to know about it? Did someone else show you this before? His expression was so severe that I stopped thinking he was being dramatic and started thinking he'd lost his mind. I told you it looks familiar. Is it your tag or something? I won't rat you out for graffiti if that's what you're so freaked out about. No, it's not my tag. The way he said it, it was like the very word was bitter in his mouth. He looked around the parking lot once more before fishing the keys out of his pocket and opening the driver's side door. Listen, forget what you ever saw, all right? I was stupid to draw it in the first place. He got into his car trying to leave, so I put my hand on the door to keep him from closing it. He gave me that look again, like he'd drive right over me if he had to. Jeff, move your hand, he said. And it sounded more like a threat than a request. You're really not going to tell me. I'd never seen Paul act this way. I'd always thought of him as one of those toys where you pull the string and they talk really fast. Realizing I wouldn't drop the subject, he took a deep breath and let it out, looking like a deflated balloon. Get in, he said. Really? Just get in before I change my mind. I took my hand off the door and hurried around to the passenger's side, hoping he wouldn't drive off before I got there. But he waited for me to get in before he started his car up and pulled out of the spot. We both stayed quiet as Paul drove off the campus and onto the road into town. It was getting dark out and the temperature was quickly dropping. After a few minutes, Paul took out a pack of cigarettes and lit one up, taking a few drags and blowing them out the window. Finally, he cleared his throat and glanced over at me like he'd forgotten I was there. How much did you know about San Palmo, he asked. I mean, like, back when it was founded. Is this a history lesson now? Listen, asshole, he blurted. Do you want to know about the symbol or not? I'd never seen Paul angry before in my life, not really, and it shocked me. Well? Yes, yes, I shot back. I asked, didn't I? He shook his head. Yeah, that's the problem. You just had to ask. He took another drag of his cigarette and I noticed his hand shook slightly. 
I assume you know as much as I used to know about this town, which is nothing. So, usually, most towns start off as a bunch of people nearby coming together to protect each other, or to share a water source or something like that, right? Well, apparently that wasn't the case here. For San Palmo, back in the 1500s, it was more religious. Like Quakers, I suggested. I remembered learning about how they'd moved around to find a place where they wouldn't be imprisoned, hanged, and had their books burned just for having their own beliefs. Or Salem, Paul nodded. And I couldn't help but laugh. You're saying San Palmo was built by witches. I'm saying I don't know. No one knows why the original settlers chose this place, only that it served their purposes. And those purposes, they were dark, man. I've heard a lot of rumors about what those might be, and none of them are worth repeating, if you know what I mean. I had no idea what he meant, but I could tell he believed every word. Paul and I had known each other for years, and if either of us were trying to play a joke on the other, we'd see it coming from a block away. Okay, so San Palmo has a history of strange religious sects. What does that have to do with the symbol? Just because it's history doesn't mean it's over, get it? There are always people you don't see. The silent ones looking to protect their interests. The kind who take care of their own business. Usually it's money. But sometimes, sometimes it's something else, something worse. You're worrying me a bit here, I say. Good. Start looking around. You won't see the strings unless you look up every so often. Only with these strings, if you cut one, three more grow back. He went on like that for a while, talking about unseen figures, deciding people's fates, and covering up truths. By the time we reached my house, I was deeply worried about Paul. I climbed out of the car in a trance, not knowing what else to say. The day had started, like any other, with another boring day of classes, and there I was, considering whether I should report Paul as a danger to himself and others. Hey, Jeff, Paul called out when I was halfway up the driveway. If you ever see that symbol, in your house, under your bed, wherever, don't bother telling anyone. It's too late to do anything about it, and you probably can't trust whoever you're talking to. I looked around my empty neighborhood, then at Paul. Do you trust me? He thought about it for a second. I did, he replied. Now I don't know. What's that supposed to mean? He snorted a, a joyless laugh. It means you're as stupid as I am. I'll see you around, Jeff. With that, he drove off, leaving me to wonder what the hell had just happened. The following Monday, Paul didn't show up for class. At first, I thought he ditched chemistry to avoid talking to me. But I asked the girl who shared a few of his other classes, and she told me he hadn't been in any of them either. It wasn't like Paul to miss class, not without at least calling someone to take notes for him. He wasn't a model student, but he had a healthy fear of his father, which meant he wasn't screwing around with attendance. All weekend, I thought of little else except Paul. The longer I sat with the story he told me, the less I believed it. Paul had always been a big fan of tall tales, from ghosts to cryptids, and everything in between, telling stories with wide-eyed belief enjoying the reaction he got out of people. The silent pup deers of San Palmo were another in a long line of his imaginative retellings, I figured, not worth getting worked up about. And yet, when he didn't show up that Monday, my mind immediately went back to his words on that strange car ride. If you ever see that symbol, don't bother telling anyone, he said. It's too late to do anything about it. On the bus home, I tried calling him more times than I could count, but every time it just went to voicemail. I left him a message telling him to get back to me and left it at that. If he was sick, then he was obviously sleeping a deep, medicated sleep. I hope that was all it was. Back at home, I tried to put it out of my mind, figuring I was only working myself up. But when I tried calling again and he still didn't answer, I became more worried than ever. No way he had been sleeping all day. It was possible that he was ignoring my calls, but at some point, the sheer number of them would make anyone think it was an emergency, especially someone who called me a friend. I decided to go for a walk and clear my head. It was a cold night, and I didn't plan on being out for long. 
But my thoughts were so preoccupied with Paul and the crazy things he'd been saying that before I knew it, I'd walk a couple of miles between my house and his. It hadn't been my intention to spy on him or anything, but now that I'd walked all the way there, I decided to check on him. The lights were on and Paul's car was in the driveway next to those of his parents, so I at least knew they were home. I felt bad knocking on his door without calling first, but, well, it was safe to say I'd tried that enough times. So I went up to the door and put my best sorry-to-bother-you folks face to ask for Paul, like we were kids again and I wanted him to come out and play. Except that when I went to knock on the door, my hand froze an inch from its surface. Because on it, written in reddish-black ink, was the symbol I'd seen in Paul's notebook. He told me I should hope to never see it again. It was just as he'd drawn it, an embellished S laid on its side with a spike, driven right through its center. I wish I could tell you how long I stood there on Paul's doorstep, frozen with doubt. Was he playing a trick on me, or was he in danger? Had everything he'd said been true? The truth is, I could have stood there much longer, or I could have run away from there and went back home, but some voice in my head told me to stick around and take a closer look. It had been a few years since I'd been inside his parents' house, but I remembered enough of the layout to know that Paul's room was in the back left corner of the first floor. I did the only thing I could think of and stepped off the porch and snuck along the side of the house. It was overgrown with trees and bushes, but I pushed through and shielded my face from the scratch of dead branches while being as quiet as possible. I didn't know what I'd see once I got there. In all likelihood, it would be a closed curtain, or at most, Paul asleep in bed. For all I knew, it was an elaborate prank orchestrated by Paul. God knows he'd messed with me before. By that point, I was okay with it all, as long as Paul was alive and safe. As I passed by one of the windows before Paul's room, I caught a glimpse of movement inside. It was the momentary change of light of someone walking in front of a lamp. Nothing more than that. But it was enough to make me turn my head to see what it was. Enough to make me wish I hadn't looked. I knew immediately which room it was, the den where Paul's parents watched TV after dinner, where Paul and I used to play video games until they kicked us out. Instantly, I picked out the silhouettes of his parents in their usual spots on the couch. But a moment after that, when I stopped to get a better look inside, I noticed the other shapes in the room. Two men and one woman stood around the room. They all wore different clothes, expensive but nondistinct. What they all had in common were the masks that hid their faces. The masks were gray, like the emotionless faces of store mannequins, with no designs or markings other than a series of thin lines crisscrossing the mouths as if they'd been sewn shut. One of the women, one of them, stood just in front of the couch where Mr. Evers sat, saying something I couldn't hear. It wasn't until my eyes adjusted to the light that I realized his hands and feet were bound by thin cord, his mouth covered by tape. Mrs. Evers was the same, except her face was streaked with running mascara. More movement caught my eye, this time on the floor. I scanned down to see a large strip of black plastic, nine or ten feet long, laid out on the floor. And at the center of the plastic, bound and gagged just like his parents, was Paul. As cold as the night had become, my legs ran even colder at the sight through the wet window. Paul wasn't crying or struggling, but the look in his eyes was worse than if he was. He looked broken and haunted, a trapped animal that had accepted its fate. It was almost unrecognizable from the guy I'd known for years, who told wild stories because he loved to be the center of attention. Now it seemed he'd gotten himself wrapped up in one of those stories, and attention was the last thing he wanted. I needed to call the police, but first I needed to make sure the mass people inside didn't see or hear me. Saving my own ass aside, I wouldn't be able to be of much help to Paul and his parents if they caught me before I could make the call. That meant I'd have to sneak away quietly from the window and back to the street before I even thought of taking out my phone. But all thought of that drained away when the two masked men pushed Mr. and Mrs. Evers to the floor wrapped cords around their necks, 
Hold them tight, squeezing off their air supplies. I felt the blunt rain from my face as they kicked and bucked next to their son, who kept staring straight ahead with wet, glassy eyes until finally their kicking stopped. They were still and silent, their eyes looking at nothing at all. I'd never been paralyzed by fear before, but my legs felt like two trees that had rooted into the hard ground. I don't know how it happened, if I moved just enough or if the light outside changed, but just then, Paul's haunted stare shifted slightly, just enough that he looked right at me. We locked eyes, him bound on the floor next to his lifeless parents, me outside the window, equally unable to move. The moment before, the masked woman took a blade from her pocket and slit his throat open. To this day, I don't know if I gasped or screamed or cried out Paul's name as the blood met plastic. I only know that the masked woman looked up, those two dead eyes aimed through the window, and tensed just enough that I knew she'd seen me. That look of recognition was the only thing that thawed my frozen legs. It sent me running back the way I'd come, pushing through the overgrowth with no attempt to protect my face from tiny cuts. I wrenched free of them, pounded the grass, scrambling, running, clearing the yard as faint sounds of a front door opening came from behind. Three blocks, all I heard was the sound of my heart exploding and my footsteps on the streets and the sound of theirs following. I ran faster than I've ever run, faster than I thought possible, pushed by the image of Paul's parents struggling to breathe and by the opening of Paul's throat like a sick flower, and also by the thought that anything less than the fastest I could run would mean either of those ends for me. I don't know how long I ran, how many turns I took down streets I'd never seen before, but by the time I slowed down enough to look back, I was alone on the street with no one in sight. After a minute of catching my breath, I figured out where I was and walked home, making sure the street was empty before I went inside. More than anything, I wanted to call the cops and tell them what had happened, tell them to look for two men and one woman wearing nice clothes with gray masks on them. But I remembered what Paul had told me, what he warned me about. Now that he was gone, I had no choice but to believe him. I couldn't trust anyone. The next day, news hit San Palmo of Paul and his parents dying from an apparent carbon monoxide leak. According to the news, all three of them died in their sleep in their own beds, likely with no idea of what was happening. Neighbors said it was a small consolation in such a tragedy, such a tragic story. But consolation nonetheless. It angered me so much to see such an obvious cover-up, but it also told me I'd been right not to trust the police. Carbon monoxide doesn't wrap a cord around your neck, and it certainly doesn't pull a blade across your throat. A year later, I graduated college and never looked back, and yet since that night, I've looked at San Palmo differently. The town where I grew up has become a sinister thing to me, a place where terrible things happen, and even more terrible people cover them up. I've thought about moving away, starting a new life somewhere fresh, but really, how many other places are just like this one? How many silent groups built towns and cities around their dark pursuits? How many of them stand in the shadows of our everyday horrors? Can we ever truly escape them? I said before that the first time I saw that symbol was in college, in the margins of Paul's notebook. I don't know if that's true, since it had seemed so familiar to me. But I do know when I saw it last. That would be last night on my front door. In a little while, I'm going to try to leave town, but something tells me I won't make it. I told you this, all this, because I trust you. Well, I did. I hope you enjoyed The Silent by Brian Martinez as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, well, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash brian martinez. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash b-r-i-a-n 
dash M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z. Thanks again for your support of the program and tonight's featured author. And more than that, a thank you to all of tonight's featured authors. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard today on this program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. Wow, 10 years already. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Chirey. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. 
Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.